everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Marketing Inc. podcast. I'm very excited to have a special guest with me today, Miss Michelle Hext. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. So Michelle, why don't you give the audience some background about who you are, what you do, and we will dive in. I guess the best place to start is what's happening right now. And then I can give you a quick recap of how I got here. Absolutely. Uh, So I'm about to launch um, a a 12 month coaching certification program for coaches and people who want to move into the business coaching type space, not life coaching. And that's under the banner of the High Ticket Coaching Institute. So I'm very excited about that. That's going on at the moment. So you can head there right now. There's a a webinar that's going on. So you can go and enroll for that if that's your jam. But I started, my first business was in the early 90s as a martial arts school owner. (laughs) It's been quite the journey here. Over the years, I've done many different things in terms of growing and extracting myself from businesses um, when I become bored. And my early days were in that martial arts space. I fell in love with martial arts and I very quickly graded my way through the ranks and I had my first martial arts school within within about 18 months of, of starting my training, which was incredible. And so I had a lot of experience in coaching people back then. I feel like one of the the reasons that I have so much strength as a coach is if you can coach somebody to grade for their black belt or full contact fight, you can pretty much coach people to, to do any of the things that scare them. And so that was a really great, what's the word I'm looking for? It was a really great primer. Yeah. 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 Or human nature primer. I was doing my martial arts stuff. I had a full-time martial arts center And then uh, this thing called life coaching or or business coaching became an actual thing in the 90s. And so I went and got myself qualified and I had my martial arts school on one side of the street at one point and my business coaching offices on the other side of the street. And I would coach during the day and then do superwoman, put my dough walk on and go and teach classes at night. And then I fell in love with the online world in about the early, around about 2003, I had my first online business, which is an online fitness website for women. And I went on to create another one of those. And then over the years, I've just evolved in teaching what I know. So my first high ticket offer, I guess you could say, was when I... I wrote a book called The Honourable Martial Arts Entrepreneur, where I wanted to teach martial arts school owners how to, you know, really set themselves apart in the industry because all martial arts schools market the same. Yeah. And I had I had launched a a women's only martial arts school and we were at capacity within six months. And I had an incredible culture there, unlike anything I'd ever done before. And so I wanted to teach people that. So I created the Honourable Martial Arts Entrepreneur. It was basically modern day marketing, but traditional martial arts schools. It was yeah. incredible. And so I, I sold that as a high ticket mentorship program, a digital course, a group coaching program. And I was you know, working with clients from all around the world, which is incredible. And so I did that for about 18 months. And then I moved on from the martial arts business space into working with female entrepreneurs in general. And that's when I had my first, it was a it was an over $200,000 launch. I went from idea to launching within about six or seven weeks. And I had that massive launch, which is incredible. And that wow. really, yeah, that really propelled me forward. And I got to see then martial arts school owners are amazing, but then they're, they're not about investing and <laughs> they're not about investing big money. And so when I moved into this female entrepreneur space and I knew how to package myself in that way I wrote another book um, called The Art of Kicking Ass Elegantly in Business Fitness Love and in Life love it yeah and it was almost like people like take all my money whereas in the martial arts space it was like I had to overcome a lot of obstacles looking younger than my years being female all that sort of stuff when most of the martial arts school owners were men whereas this was so easy and so since then that was 2014 and since then I've been working in that space, but I just continue to niche down more and more. And over the last handful of years, I've gotten really good at helping people take whatever expertise that they have and monetize it through initially big high ticket offers 
that we we start small so that they can we master it small so they can then scale it really big. So we start with this super high end offer. It's packaged really well. It works like the clients know what it is and they're excited to buy it. And then we work on um, scaling it from there. And so I work with a lot of coaches, but I also work with a lot of industry experts who want to turn their, you know, the stuff between their ears into monetized products. I love that. Such a great background. You really have that local business understanding, which I love. And also the online marketing, coaching, sales, really something that I feel in the last two years, more local businesses have really woken up to. They've been forced to in a lot of ways. And traditionally, they've been lagging behind the times in many of these technological advances, implementing different automation tools and software, but especially where online marketing is concerned, it's a big challenge for them. And so can you tell me how early on when you were doing that martial arts school, what was it that really forced you to step outside of the traditional box that most martial arts schools were really using to grow their business and say, I need something different. And what were those early things that you did? And obviously, given that it was in 2003 or was this in the late 90s when that was 90s yeah early 90s and late 90s and we have a lot of different options than we had then but honestly the fact that you were getting in to that so early is really impressive I wish that I was old enough at that time to be able to tap into the untapped potential of so many of these tools so I'd love to hear how that initial transition from being that physical bricks and mortar to moving more online how that took place yeah, sure. I think if, if you're a natural entrepreneur and you, I, I think for me, it started with a need. I, be, I became a single mum and I was, as I say, working in my coaching business during the day, teaching the martial arts classes at night. And that was not every night. It was like Monday through Thursday. And then I would do some work on Saturday morning sometimes. And as my kids got a little bit older and I realized that I would be gone at night and they would be gone during the day and I was a single mom and it just felt really important to me to be around for my kids. Absolutely. And so the, the in the early 2000s, this was when the online space was, for me, opening up. I feel like I was a late adopter, but I look back and I probably really was an early adopter, but I feel like people were doing it well before me. But this is the thing that I would love for people to take away. I tapped into what is it that I love to do the most and where do I have the most impact and what is the thing that feels most natural to me about the work that I do. And if I went back to the the coaching and if I went back to the martial arts, it was always the thing that I do better than anybody I know is help people to figure out what their strengths are and to basically start to take risks that they would normally not take because they feel so confident in themselves. And I thought I can take that skill really and apply it to anything. And so when I first launched my online fitness business, for example, I knew that it wasn't about me standing over somebody counting reps for them to get the result. I knew it was the mind that I had to deal with. And so I took them, you're like, yes, here's the program. Yes, here's the meal plan. But in my, still my belief that you really don't need anything super specific in that space unless you want to step on stage or whatever. But the average person just wants to lose weight and feel great. And so I thought, well, what's the, why aren't they doing that? And for me, it was, well, they're not managing their mind. They, they don't have the level of accountability mm-hmm. or they, they have a bad day and they have an effort moment where they're like, oh, you know, screw this. I'm not doing it anymore. I'll start on Monday or whatever. So I got really good at working on people's minds and helping them to create this success pathway. And I just took that online. But I feel like any business can do it. It doesn't need to be, I specialize in service service offers as opposed to products. That's not my area of expertise. But if I look at anything in a service-based um, industry, we've just got to look at like what, how do we get to package this thing in a way that makes sense to people? It's super clear and they know what's in it for them. And so sales become very easy and a natural part of a process for me when people are attracted to what they see initially. 
So remember, if anybody is online Googling, it's because they have a problem. What are they? Go- why are they Googling? Why are they at their keyboard? Why are they online? What are they looking for? So you need to be the hook. So when they find you, you it needs to resonate with them. We need to really reach out to people in our copy and our imagery and let them know that, hey, I'm talking to you. I know the problem that you have. And listen to me for a little bit. Explain the problem so that I can show you that I deeply understand your problem. And here's how I get to solve it. And if this this feels like your jam, then let's talk. And a lot of the time, people are trying to do too much. They're trying to do too much and they're trying to complicate things and make them too fancy. And we don't have time on the internet now to try and make things too fancy. People just want to cut to the chase. We're done with the 400 foot long sales pages and things like that. Now people just, they want to feel it initially. They want to be hooked and go, oh, yeah, this makes sense to me. And then they'll read or they'll skim or whatever it is. But they want to know that you understand them and understand the problem that they're going through before they even, you know, want to consider if if you're somebody that can help them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this applies to really all types of businesses, not just coaching, really anything. Like you said, people want a service or a product. They have a problem. And the problem is obviously great enough that, they would be seeking out some sort of help. But even before someone actually realizes that they may need the help, that same type of content and imagery can really show them that this is something that they're dealing with and maybe it's subconscious and they don't actually realize that yet. So let's take it back a couple of steps. You were talking about the offers that you help people put together, helping them be really high-end, well-packaged, making sure that it's extremely clear and desirable Walk me through some of the steps of how you go about helping some of your clients do that. Yeah, I will. One thing that I just didn't mention, I'll just quickly add that. And and in the sales um, process, we want to reduce risk as well. We want to give people plenty of reasons to to err on the side of, yes, this feels good, as opposed Mm -hmm. to this feels really risky. Yeah. So with regards to the process, it's really like the first step is just helping my clients unpack like what is the biggest asset that they have between their ears right now? And anybody that's in the entrepreneurial space or in business, we all have lots of ideas. We've got lots of ideas and we often try to chase a number of them at a time. So I'm very strict with my clients about we have one focus. We have one offer that we're going to make fly and then we have to put all the other components together with it. So I help them to unpack and simplify what the offer is, but one of the steps in that is I help them create the success pathway for their client or their framework. If you don't know how you're going to get a result for a client, there's a funky energy there and you're not going to go forward and be really confident in in selling your offers. So I make sure that they know how they're going to get the client result. They know that this feels like something that they can do with one hand tied behind their back because it's really clear. And then, so that's the first thing. We've got the idea. We've got the framework. We know what we need to do now. And then write out the copy or the just do a brain dump of all of the, the components that are important. So what's the headline? What's the problem? What's the solution? What's the offer? What are the features? What are the benefits? How do we move people into that? So all of those things come into place. And then it's a matter of, Once we've got a rock solid product that everybody feels really good about, we have to figure out how are we going to get people to know about the offer? How are we going to get people to say yes to the offer? And so we have the product. Now we have to look at like the the lead generation or the, the prospects, making sure that we've got a list of prospects. So if this is the offer and this is our market, then What's going to be a way that we can move people into our world? And typically in the online space, we know that's some sort of a lead generation tool. So it could be a webinar or a video series or a checklist or whatever whatever feels like the best fit for you and for your particular offer and clients. So we go ahead and we develop that in a really classy, high quality way. We like for me, that's that's almost more important than the offer itself. 
because if people don't know about the offer, then they're not going to, you're not going to have people. So every digital asset on the way is important. So your opt-in page, whether it's a lead magnet or whatever it is, that digital asset has to be high ticket. It has to be worthy of high ticket if that's what you're selling. <clears throat> and then from there, you have to move them into your sales process. So what does that look like for you? Have a really good think about it. Don't look left and right. Don't look at what other people are doing. If it feels right to run calls, if it feels right to just move people from a webinar into your high ticket offer, do that. If it feels better to move them from the high ticket offer into something more on the lower side to give them a taste to reduce the risk, then do that. There's no hard and fast rule. People feel like investing in traffic is one of these things that they put off. I'm working with a, a client at the moment who's a personal trainer and Facebook ads weren't working for him. So he's moved across to Google ads and I got a message from him which just now going, and he's a local business. And so he, it's going off, like it's going off and he's very high ticket and the ads are going crazy. And now we've got that right. It's like we dial it up or we dial it down depending on how much time and energy that they've got. So again, like that traffic and the way that you move people into that traffic, that's another asset, your ad copy, the ad images. That's another asset that you want to spend time building because when you have all of these components, when you have the ad assets, like the, the as I say, the imagery and the whatever, and then you move them into a lead page that is another high quality digital asset, you only need to build these once. Then you get to tweak them and all of the rest of it. But invest in the steps along the way, get clear about what the offer is first, be really confident in that, and then figure out what are the assets that you need to build between from cold traffic all the way through to people saying yes, take the time to do it. Don't rush it. I'm not saying it needs to take years, but give yourself weeks instead of hours, you know, or days instead of hours. If you've already got a really clear idea, invest in the people to help you to do that so that you're not spending time and energy and, and money on wasted efforts. Like we want to be efficient. And sometimes it feels efficient to DIY it, but in my experience, so much of the time people are, are leaving thousands and thousands of dollars of unearned income or revenue on the table because they're trying to trying to do it themselves. And we in the early days, I remember if somebody had said to me, you need to invest in this stuff, it's really important, I would have been, I can't afford it. But you can't afford not to. You just got to find a way. And money is a renewable resource. Like we, we know how to make money. We can make money. We can sell things if we need to, to invest in those assets. So we set ourselves up right from the beginning. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And this is so much of what I focus on every day. It's what I'm so passionate about. But there is definitely that mental block, like you were mentioning earlier with so many business owners. And we specialize in paid traffic. So this is one of the first things that I really hear from people and they are scared to spend. And I think part of it is that they may have tried the wrong things in the past or could have been the perfect platform for them, but they had no strategy behind it. They didn't have those digital assets. They didn't have an offer at all. It was more buy my products and services. Why aren't people buying them? And so understanding that even if you've failed with certain things in the past, it doesn't mean they don't work. I think anyone can open their eyes and Take a look at people who are using every paid ad platform, every type of strategy really successfully, but it's because it's working for them. It's something that has been tailored to exactly what their industry or their market or their ideal clients and what they personally really need. And so I think if people can get out of their own way when it comes to spending, they will be able to expedite this because I've seen so many times where my students will actually set up their entire system. And that's the process we go through as well. So we will do it a done with you or a done for you and getting their offer, getting their landing pages, getting their assets, everything's done and ads are the next step. And they've already taken all this time and energy and effort to create the system, which you need to be able to monetize your traffic, but they get so scared to simply publish and see what happens. And I think that 
for everyone, you don't know what you need to change until you get the data in. And there's no way to get enough data in if you're not going to spend. And going back to what you said, I feel like anybody in business should be confident in their ability to make money no matter what circumstances they're put in. So if the worst case scenario is that you have to hustle to find a way to make money, I don't think that's such a bad scenario. So you're absolutely right. I think it's too many people are also missing this full vision. They don't really know what it needs to look like to be successful because they've never had anything that's been close to it. But when you are able to get to that stage where it is, a budget adjustment to get more leads, more appointments, more sales, or less if you get overwhelmed. I don't think there's anything better than that. You're really putting your business growth in your own hands with the control to make these things happen. So, so many great things that you mentioned before. So you also were talking about helping people reverse the risk or feel as little risk as possible in terms of making that sale and that that could be done just, you know, through sales calls without calls. Is there something that you found works really well across a variety of industries when it comes to putting people at ease, taking that next step and investing? Yeah, there is. Do you mind if I just jump back a little second to just just spoke about? So I think, think the thing, there are two things that I notice about the pay traffic thing, right? The first thing is that, like you say, so many people will say it's not working. I'm like, well, what's the offer? What's the what's there's no strategy involved. They're just throwing money at the internet and there's yeah. no strategy and it doesn't work. And but what they they do is they often will hand over to somebody like you, here, just sort it out for me. And they ha- they they want to remove all kind of responsibility That's for what right. it is. Absolutely. You've got it's your business. You've got to drive it. It's not your job, Ali, to to create that for them. I'm not 100% sure of exactly what you do and you're going to yeah. guide them, but but their ideas in their brain, like they know what they're capable of. You've got to exactly. get uncomfortable and you've got to be prepared to go down that road and do that work and figure things out because the more you do that, the, the higher chance of applying the ads over the top of that is, is going to work. And the other thing as well is intention. So last year, I had my biggest revenue year ever, and I made more mistakes than ever. I invested. It was my year. The theme that I set for last year was throw over. No, it was the year of no stone unturned. I tried different price points. I wanted to sell on volume at one point, and I did all the things. Record year. But it was... And I had this experimental object, you know, objective view of it. So mm-hmm. I wasn't freaked out when things didn't work or whatever. But it, it was like, it was really interesting. That's what it took to have a record year, making lots of mistakes. And I think in your role, you would see it a lot, right? Where people come to you and they're like, okay, run me some ads. Like, this is the thing. And then it doesn't work. And then they pull it and they go. This is a, this is not a, bullseye every time first time around it can take a lot of time and energy and so my and and testing and measuring and so my next launch where where the open card is on the 14th to the 19th of February and then but I'm aware that I may have one launch this year I may have 10 launches this year I don't know because this particular product is untested. And so we don't, we well, haven't run um, paid traffic for this particular campaign before. We don't know how much tweaking we need to do. But the benefit of my experience tells me that if we get it, you know, off the first time round, that's going to be like a unicorn and I'll be happy. But my expectations are it could take anything from one launch to six or seven launches this year to make it happen. And I think there's, we see the highlight reel on Instagram and we watch people have seven figure launches and multiple seven figure launches. And we feel like they just pulled it out of their butt and it just happened. But we don't know how many inverted commas failed or or I guess test launches they've had until they get to that point. And so you've got to be prepared to see it all the way through. And that's why having confidence in your offer and the funnel that you've built out is second to none, because I know I'm not changing the damn product because it is perfect. 
So what else do we need to change? Maybe it's the targeting. Maybe it's the messaging. Maybe that's the wrong theme for the webinar, but mm -hmm. the product doesn't change because I have 100% confidence in it. And so people need to have that level of confidence in their office and they need to be willing to go down the path and that path can be long and turning and twisting. And if they have to hustle to make the money, then they need to do that. And so for me, my one-on-one -on -one mentoring now is 10,000 US dollars a month. And so I know that I can always lean on, lean into perhaps past clients or my list or whatever and offer that up. And I know I'm never going to have a problem with funding the long-term growth of my business. Yeah. And so you've got to have those things in your business built in because if you're going big, it's going to cost you money and it's going to cost you time and you need to invest before it pays back sometimes. And so you need to have those money-making tactics behind you so that, that you can fund that so you can stay the until, until it works. So I hope that helps somebody because oh, I'm really absolutely. passionate about that, really passionate about that because I, totally I know a lot agree. of yeah, yeah. And so let's get back to the risk. So is there anything that works? Just give people an experience of you and be real. So what works for me is saying to people, we're going to go from zero to scale in 12 months. It's going to be challenging. It's going to take longer. It's going to cost more than you thought, all those things. It's, I'm not going to paint a unicorn story yeah. for them because I know the reality. Mm -hmm. And I know that I would rather have someone say to me, this works, but you're going to have to be prepared to work for it. Like I can work. I know how to do that. So we want to just be real with our people, but also give them an experience. And so when we're looking at my 12-month um, certification program, the way that I get to do that is I get people on my webinar. They get to have an experience of me. Then I move them into a $97 product, which is a five-day immersion. So every day, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, catch up on the weekend, then Monday, Tuesday, every single day, I'm going to show up and I'm going to give them training. They're going to have a workbook. They're going to get used to the way that I teach. Mm -hmm. They're going to have some quick wins. They're going to see that, oh, this is making more and more sense to me now. And so it's going to be very easy for people to say yes to that $10,000 offer at the end of that mm -hmm. because they know me, they get to trust me. And so I, I'm not about creating a checklist for somebody as a lead magnet into a $10,000 offer yeah. because it doesn't make sense. It no. doesn't make sense. And so it's got to flow and it's got to make sense. And so for me, it makes sense to give people me, give them an experience of what this is going to be like. I'm asking them to spend 12 months with me. They will know in five days whether I'm for them or not, and I will know if they're for me or not. And so the re reducing risk is just whatever. Like being that. honest sometimes. Yeah. And it's you're still. totally right. So one of my first launch strategies when I started my mentorship program, because I, I used to be agency like completely done for you, 100%. Never really thought I wanted to be in the coaching space. I had a negative connotation with it for the reasons you mentioned. People weren't like that. And I saw so many people that were over-exaggerating everything. And it just, it didn't feel right to me to put myself in that bubble. And then I invested in my first coach and my second coach. I had great experiences and my coach actually encouraged me to start my program. I don't know if I, I'd like to think I would have done it eventually, but he is really the reason that I started it in general, just him pushing me based on what the market was telling me. And so I had done five day challenges for a while, just Early on in my business, it was something I really liked to do. I always loved to teach, even though that wasn't the core of my business. And the five-day challenges work so well for that exact reason. People have such an opportunity to get to know you. And especially if you are teaching people something, there's no better way to see who's actually a fit than the people who will show up to learn and implement. So it's, I have some students that do more done-for-you style businesses in all different types of industries. I'm not recommending five-day challenges for them typically because it's not a match with the type of consumer that they're looking for. And so the offer being really understood and detailed is so critical, but then it has to point you 
to that strategy that you really need to use to sell that offer. So if you guys haven't checked it out yet, my offer creation workbook is something I spent so much time creating. And if you haven't grabbed it, I'll make sure that there is a link in the description. It's free. It's very in-depth and detailed. It's probably one of the biggest just issues or most misunderstood concepts of marketing. I feel like there's not enough people really stressing the importance, but also helping people understand what theirs should be. Even local businesses. I would say the most common theme I see through everyone I've ever worked with is that no one has an offer (laughs) at all. They have a product or a service and you've got to get it right if you want the next step to actually produce the results that you're looking for. Yeah, and it's all about results-based offers, right? In the coaching industry, especially in the life coaching space, it drives me mad because they think a a 12-week coaching package for the price of 10 is a package. It's not. It's a bundle of money hours for dollars that's all it is yeah and you spoke about the offer and the offer is so important but when it comes to the marketing you've got to know your people and a lot of people are too lazy to do the work around figuring out who their people are or they go down the path of the ideal customer avatar thing and it's been done to death and they don't look outside the box and they're trying to figure out i don't know which magazines they read or what car they drive and it's That's not what we need anymore. We need to look at what their online behaviours are and things like that. But I feel like the fact that you've moved on and done the consulting type thing or the coaching type thing, you're my dream client. These are the people that I work with because they know their stuff and they just need help unpacking it. A lot of them do have resistance around the coaching for exactly what you're talking about. But for me, like I, I was trained by David Rock he was a very pure coach, like in the business space, especially. And so what I do now, and probably what you do now, like technically is more consulting and mentoring than it is coaching, because pure coaching is asking questions to have the client tap into their own answers. And when people are paying you the big bucks, they don't want you to say, what do you think you need to do? They're like, tell me what I need to do. And let's figure out how we do it in my way. And so a lot of people that are in the same kind of um, circumstance that you are, you've created success and there's a demand. People are saying, can I pick your brains? Can I buy you a coffee? I need to ask you about this thing. That's a sign that you have something of value and we need to monetize it. And when you're successful in an area, the natural evolution for us is to want to teach what we know. And then we want to teach what we know to more people. We want to scale it. We want to tell everybody what we do. So when I launched my female-only martial arts school, it was like, oh, my God, everybody needs to know how to do this because I went from teaching 40 classes a week to teaching six. I packaged doing people that wanted to come and and try. They could just come and try a couple of classes and away they would go. And reducing the risk in that aspect was People don't want to come in and join in with black belts and feel like they've got to fight to the death. Yeah, the black yeah. belts don't want to come out of their own training and teach people how to, the beginners that may or may not stay. Yeah. So I packaged up a four-week absolute beginner program and that was only beginners. It was four weeks. It was two classes a week. My conversion rate went from 30% to almost 100% just because I created the environment and reduced the risk for them coming in. So think about like, why are people not buying? Know your audience and why are people not buying? Figure out how you can reduce that risk for them. And that's going to help so much. So that's really one thing that I always try and encourage people in when they are launching a new offer or really trying to get their system set up for the first time. Once people see what's possible on the automation side, they tend to want to go full on automation, remove themselves from the process altogether. But the truth is, unless your offer is tried and true and you have everything that's been tested, you've had those one-on-one conversations with your ideal client. You know who they are because they tell you. You also hear all of the objections that people are giving you you can integrate that into your automation and your processes and start to remove yourself more. But they seem to want to just skip over all that and go directly into this automated sales process. And they are missing 
all of the feedback they really need to actually be able to tweak it. If somebody says they're not going to buy, you don't just say, okay, have a great day or best of luck. Ask them, get to know why those reasons are and be willing to hear what they have to say and consider it 100% valid because this is a person that could have bought but didn't buy. And those experiences, I feel like, give you the best ad copy and the best sales page copy and everything that you need to be able to tap into people on a deeper level. You mentioned that psychology is something you're really passionate about. And that is one of my favorite things in the world. And I think that for those who are not trained in psychology, it doesn't matter. Human behavior, human nature, communication, and the way that people respond to things, it's important for every business owner because even if you're selling a product online, no communication whatsoever, it's still a person on the other end that's buying or not buying. And you've got to just geek out on understanding what these people are thinking and feeling and looking for so that you can improve either the offer or the product or the service or the process itself. So it's like this weird stage where either people are terrified to even really implement automation strategies in their business or these more mass communication strategies, or they want to do that alone and they never want to talk to a human again. Yeah. That would be a nice little fit there in the middle. But I do think it it's appealing to everyone to not have to have any type of sales conversations, unless you are someone who loves sales a lot. I've always enjoyed talking to people, so it's not something that stresses me out at all. But the truth is that no matter what, there's going to be communication, there's going to be feedback, and you really need their information, good or bad, and especially bad, in my opinion. So I'd love to hear your take on that. I know that you've really been studying people and their thought process, especially in the health and fitness space, getting people to overcome their own issues about losing yeah. weight. I think that's probably one of the best examples that we could find. So what were your processes to, to help them overcome their own mental blocks? Yeah, I think for me, the first thing is be sure that what they want is what they want. A lot of the time, I was even working with someone a little while ago and, and their vision was... I want to get this right. And then I want to open, it was brick and mortar and I want to open multiple venues around the place. And I'm like, but do you really, do you really like that sound good? (laughs) Yeah. Like it's, but that's the old version of scale, right? Yeah. Especially in the brick and mortar space. We want to think about things like, oh, it's going to be so cool to have all these. And I'm like, do you know how many people you're going to have to manage? And then I'm like, okay, how about we look at developing this online aspect? And they're like, oh, that sounds heaps better. But this is a dream that they had been chasing for many years. And so a lot of the times people don't really know what they want. They're just conditioned to believe that this is a natural next step. And I had another client who had this vision of traveling the world working from her laptop but at the same time she again wanted to open it like brick and mortar business put it in another town I'm like how does that free you up to do that and she was like oh no yeah it doesn't so I had her develop an online course and so the first thing whether it's the weight loss whether it's whatever it is right figure out do you really want it even people that were like I want to get my black belt and I'm like but do you like really is that why you want to do this Mm -hmm. so I'm always curious about why people want what they want so we've got to figure out that first but most of the time it's not what they want so we've got to figure out what is it that they want and then we've got to help them to understand that they can actually have it but it's not the unicorn journey. I'm all about leveraging the, the laws of the universe and stuff, but you've got to do the work and you've got to be prepared that it's not always going to be easy. It's a roller coaster. There is no sugar coating. It is a roller coaster. So you've got to be all in there. And so helping them to overcome that stuff is just making sure the carrot is big enough, making sure that you've had the conversation, you've set the expectations that this has got to be something you want so bad because when we're on this roller coaster and when you're on the down phase, you still got to be excited about this thing. You've still got to believe in this thing. You've still got to believe you have it. And so then it's really just a matter of like, let's be honest, most blocks are fear-based they're fear-based or worthiness-based. They don't think that they can have it. 
or they don't believe it's possible or they believe something will happen. If they're visible, then people will they'll get the haters or whatever it is. So we've got to figure out what the resistance is because the resistance is usually not the thing that they say it is as well. We've got to get underneath it. I'm no psychologist. I've not studied it. I just know people. Yeah. And yeah. so if something sounds like BS, it's usually BS. And it's like, it's not that you don't have time or it's not that the, what is really going on. Because if you had the time, I've got a feeling you still wouldn't do it. And they're like, yeah, okay, so what's it about? I'm scared of this thing. And it's like, cool, now we know what we're dealing with. Let's just figure that out. And so for me, I always see my role as like we know what the client wants and we know where they are. And I'm like the dust sweeper. I'm just keeping the path clear. And that's just so that they can keep moving forward so that they achieve the thing. And the sweeping of the dust is just helping them recognize their own BS or sometimes they have to heal something. Sometimes they have to just forget something. It's that whole, do we accept it because we can't change it? Do we change it if we can change it? We make peace with and accept it if we can't. And then we focus on the thing that we want instead of the thing that we fear. And then sometimes those steps forward are really small. And sometimes we've got to park for a little bit while we deal with a situation like childhood trauma or something like that. That's not my area of expertise. I think you need to do some work around that. Mm-hmm. Come back and, and you can do that personal development stuff while you do the business stuff. You don't have to be this perfectly zen, having healed all the things person before you then go on and and do business. People want to wait for perfect, but it's never going to happen. Recognizing what the resistance is and knowing what it really is. So it's not about time because if it was about time, like you knew about the time before you started, you knew when you set the goal and you wanted to do this thing that you were going to be busy or that you had to manage your time. So nothing's really changed. So I really want to have those conversations with people that, okay, this is what you, like I say to them at the start, be sure this is what you really want because I'm going to hold you to that. And sometimes I'm going to encourage you. Sometimes I'm going to kick your butt. Other times I'm going to have really open and honest conversations with you that you might not enjoy. They're going to make you go in. The inner game is just as important as the strategy, always. And so we've got to have that level of self-awareness or be willing to, at least, because you would have seen it too. You have two people, same experience, same awesome looking funnel, same fabulous offer, same price point. And the one that believes they're worthy of the success and is just so determined to have it will have it. And the one that's sitting there in the fetal position, tentatively going, well, well, yeah, they're the ones that stop the ads, start the ads, stop the ads, start the ads, feel like, no, no, this isn't it. I need to fix it. And it's like all this resistance is pouring out of them and manifesting, not recognizing that this is just you being scared. So having that level of self-awareness is critical in business. Oh, absolutely. And it's funny because I was actually having this conversation with my masseuse. I tend to have deep life conversations with my (laughs) masseuse and she probably knows me better than just about anyone at this point. And we were just talking about life and different things that are happening. And she asked me, you always seem so sure of everything that you want. How did you get that way? And I'd never really thought about it much, to be honest, because I've always been a pretty self-assured person. I know what my strengths are. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not. I tend to not do the things I'm not great at, or if it's super important to me, I'll do what it takes to master that thing if it's something I really want. But ultimately, I think... I have been a writer my whole life and I have written since I could hold a pencil or a pen. And sometimes that is some of the deepest self-reflection that you can possibly have. And whatever format that is, maybe for some people it'd be making audio recordings or video recordings. For me, writing's always been natural, but you don't always know what it is you're thinking or feeling or why something's wrong. I'm sure everyone has a time they can remember where someone says, what's wrong? And and you say, I don't know. There is something wrong. You can't put your finger on it. And I do think that people really overlook that, that they may be themselves. And at the end of the day, you're right. If you believe you can have it and you're willing to put in the work and get the expertise from people that have experiences or knowledge that you don't have to help you put the pieces together, 
you can do it. Avoiding the next step has always been something that's really puzzled me, I would say, because especially when someone's serving up the next step on a platter with here's everything you need for it. Here's the exact instructions to do it. And then you will find those people that still don't do it. And they'll come back on the next call with the same question and the same situation. And I never want to make people feel crappy about that. But at the same time, you can't appease that type of behavior or they will be in the exact same position for the rest of their lives. So part of this is the the strategy and the offer and everything. And the other part is like just getting out of your own way and being really excited too. I think people who aren't excited about what they're doing are naturally yes. not going to have the same drive to go after things. But like you mentioned before, people may think they want something or they may think they love the business they're in or the industry they're in or the format of the business, but in fact, they actually hate it. In today's world, transitioning to something different is not really that difficult at the end of the day. I feel like it's easier than it's ever been before in the history of the world. And taking somebody like a personal trainer who's working in a bricks and mortar that maybe isn't happy with the types of clients they're working with or the, the structure of the business that person can absolutely take exactly what they have now, do it in a different format, find more happiness, find more success, make more money, and really impact people on a bigger level. So it's it sometimes can be a lot easier and more simple than people think. But I guess that deep work is not, it's not the most fun for most of us, I'd say. So it tends to be something you probably have to really hold someone accountable for. Yeah, for sure. And It's easy to do, I think, because it shows up in the ways that we expect. Procrastinating over getting something done, avoiding to do a task or whatever it is. If this is really important to you, then this should not even be a a thing. So we've got to figure out what this is. In the earlier days, my first book, it spoke a little bit about my childhood. So I grew up in that, you know, sexual abuse, domestic violence, not a lot of money, things like that. I was forced to leave school at 14, moved out when I was 16. And and I've had a big life. Like I've done a lot of things over the years. And so I used to tend to want to, you know, roll my sleeves up and work in that space because I knew that the conversations would help them. And then I realised at one point, this costs me too much. Like it's getting in the way of what I do best, which is cold strategy, but it's the yeah. strategy stuff. And I just... I know my limits now and it's like, look, this is what this looks like to me. What do you think? And then, yeah, go sort it out and come back. Like I I help bring it to awareness and send them in the direction that I think they need to go and to sort it out. But it's not my job to, to do that inner work. And I was attracting a lot of clients. And that's the thing, right? When we attract clients that that drain the life out of us, I think it's a rite of passage. It happens, but then we associate that with coaching, you yeah. know, or consulting or whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be that way. So I've found over the years, the, the higher my prices have gone, the less demanding my clients. I barely hear from them in between our sessions and things like that. And it's just a beautiful place to be. I love my clients. We become friendly and some people become friends after. Even when my friends pay me to work with them, it's like the friendship's on hold yeah. until we do this because I I'm a very feeling type person and I can't do that to do my job. I've got to be very much about the business, like the goal that we've set, the targets, the way we're going to do it, the strategy, and then moving you through the the emotional stuff so that we can get there, but in a really kind of way that serves me and honors them. So much knowledge here. I'm sure we could do (laughs) different interviews with many different topics within it. But thank you so much for coming today, Michelle. So if people want to learn more about you, where can they go to find you? Yeah, they can go to michellehex.com, which is my main website. And if you're interested in the certification program, there's a link there that you can take it. I'm on Instagram at michellehext as well. And that's got like a link. You can have a look at all the different links there. But um, definitely um, drop into my DMs on Insta and let me know that you heard this episode and Yeah, it it would be great to hear from you. And thank you so much for having me. It was an awesome conversation. That is it for today, everybody. Make sure that you share this episode with your favorite entrepreneurs and I will see you back on the next one. 